Howdy and welcome back to Celebrating Vintage Model Kits. We're continuing uh, Midway Week with uh, the Brewster Buffalo. Uh, this particular kit uh, is a uh, one that was uh, put out by MRC, which was a, an importer of mainly Japanese model kits uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, they uh, also uh, imported uh, Tamiya. They're the ones who brought Tamiya into the United States, but uh, this particular one here was uh, made uh, in the early 70s. Can't nail down the exact date of when this kit was uh, boxed and, and sold in the U.S., but it is a rebox of a 1964 Aoshima uh, kit. So it's a uh, uh, 70 second scale. Um, box says that it's uh, the Brewster F2A2. Uh, it's hard to tell the difference between some of the models of the Brewster Buffalo. Not only were there the ones that were made for the Navy Marine Corps, but there are also a number of them that were made for the, the export market, which had slight variations. Um, but uh, externally, it, it becomes very difficult to tell the difference between the different models. And so let's take a look at this and see what we got. So we've got a uh, uh, fairly simple you know, artwork on the cover. I think this... Uh, Maybe a copy of one of the other uh, issues from Aoshima, not the original issue, but one of the later issues from the later 60s. Uh, Precision Plastic Model, F2A2 Buffalo, and MRC, which if you're unfamiliar, stands for Model Rectifier Corporation. On the side, we've got uh, s some information about the kit, uh, what comes with it, retractable landing gear, sliding canopy, movable flaps, rotating propeller. And then a list of some of the other kits that are being sold uh, by MRC, including Adonis, Avenger, Wildcat, and such. Opposite side, similar again. Different uh, box art on here. And listing again of the different aircraft being available. End of the box. Same artwork, you do have your kit number, 304-69, so this would have been a 69 cent kit. And the other side's the uh, same. Bottom side of the box does have a plan form of the uh, aircraft, it kind of showing a color scheme, which is a little odd. Um, does give a little bit of information about the aircraft and some painting instructions on here as well and there's a uh, MRC's uh, New Jersey address so let's take a look at what we got in here it's a side opening box molded in silver that aside and we do have instruction sheet that is printed in Japan feels like that same Japanese paper that we saw some of the other kits kind of thin but uh, glossy type of paper uh, get a little bit more substantial uh, instructions than we saw on that Entex Wildcat uh, previously so it does break it down a little bit more, showing you a little more detail, a little bit of writing in here explaining how to, to do things. Uh, it does have uh, stuff for the retractable landing gear here, which is kind of different for a kit of this size. It does show you that it does have flaps that are retractable and ailerons that are removable. And interestingly, a three-piece canopy, it's kind of different for a kit of this size again. More information about other ones in the series. Some more decal placement. We do get a uh, diagram of parts, uh, including the parts numbers on here. And uh, another list of kits from them. And nothing on the back. There are the kit supply decals and you get a set of British markings. Uh, the roundels are kind of off 
not quite uh, correctly centered. Uh, bright colors, a little brighter than probably would have been on the real aircraft. And squad, or the uh, actual serial number for the aircraft, AS-417. You do get a set of American stars, uh, but no other American markings on it. But you do get the full set of, of six, uh, which unlike the, uh, the F4F kit that we saw only had four stars, which made it a little hard to do the whole correct camouflage. Interesting that the uh, serial number on here, the 417, does not match the one that's on the box cover, which is AS430. Well, let's talk about that airplane. Uh, the uh, AS417 was part of uh, an order that was originally placed by Belgium. Uh, they ordered some B339Bs from Brewster to bolster their their Air Force for the uh, impending war that everyone knew was coming. Uh, Brewster, being Brewster, took forever to uh, get that order going, and uh, by the time they were delivering them, only two of them actually made it to Belgium, and the remaining 38 ended up uh, uh, going to uh, Great Britain. Uh, they assigned uh, the aircraft from that lot to the fleet air arm, uh, this particular one for AS-417 uh, ended up uh, being assigned to uh, Fleet, Air Ar Fleet Air Arm uh, 759 Squadron, uh, which had them on strength uh, somewhere between September 40 and July 41. Uh, a few of the other Buffaloes uh, that uh, the Fleet Air Arm got, they sent over to the Middle East uh, and uh, saw a little bit of action over there. But it appears that uh, this particular one, 417, never made it out of Britain. Uh, it was eventually struck off charge and uh, used as an instructional airframe. So there are a couple of images available for this particular plane, so I'll show you those here. Before we get into the kit review, just want to make a quick mention. If uh, you've built any of the uh, kits that have been featured in any of the videos, um, you know, you've still got it in your collection. Uh, it'd be nice if you could take some pictures of it or a little video of it, send it in to us for our viewer build videos that we're producing. Uh, you know, if you don't have a, an exact one of uh, one of the ones that we made, but something kind of tied to what we're making, like another Aoshima kit or uh, a buffalo made by another uh, maker, you know, something like that, something kind of related to, to what we're showing. I think it'd be kind of neat uh, for other viewers to see what some of these kits end up looking like and what you can do with them. So all that being said, let's go on with the uh, with the kit review. So we'll start with the fuselage on this. Um, so you can see they do uh, raised panel lines and rivets. Uh, shape of the Buffalo here is a little bit in question. I know it's kind of a tubby aircraft, but this looks especially tubby. You do get the, uh, do get some flash along here, but there is a representation of the periscope gun sight on top here, which actually should go further back into the cockpit. There's no, nothing showing for an arrestor hook, so that would be correct for the B339s that were being sent. You get your tailplanes. Fabric representation is just by some raised lines on there. And then here's what I believe are supposed to be the flaps. Nice sinkholes in them, sinkholes on the surface of the uh, tailplane as well, and virtually nothing in the cockpit. So that's it for that. Let's take a look at the next one. Here we've got the uh, bottom of the wing. Again, raised panel lines, lots of rivets. Uh, you got outlines for where the, the windows on the bottom would be. Got little lumps for the exhaust stubs. Propeller, the hub and the blades are all molded together. So you've got a lot of cleanup on that to make that look presentable. Got very simplistic landing gear, which I guess would be kind of typical if you're gonna be making it operating. 
Then you've got two different pilots. Uh, well, what are supposed to be kind of pilots. you got got a spaceman guy here. Almost looks like a space jockey from uh, the Alien movie. And then you've got uh, just got a head and part of a torso. And uh, the reason why it is is the original Aoshima version of this kit uh, was motorized, as a lot of these early Japanese kits uh, were all, all seem to be motorized. And so in order to make space for the motor, uh, you couldn't have a full-size pilot figure stuck in there. So they gave you that little half-size guy to stick in there if you were going to use the motor. So that's that. Let's look at the uh, wing top wings. Some representation of the gun bay blisters. Got your separate aileron pieces here. The representation of fabric covering on it. Injection pin marks all over the place. Your wheels are very simple. And uh, another part of the uh, landing gear struts for the operable landing gear. So you can see how the uh, flaps would have fit in these little slots here. Not sure how they would stay up when you were making the model, but they're there. Not something you saw in, in too much uh, 70 second scale stuff back in the day. This fell off the tree. This is the, uh, the representation of the engine. Very simple representation. The air scoops, little dimples for the gun ports, the cowling. And then you do have the three-piece canopy, which like we saw on the F4F, put their ejector pin mark right in the middle of the canopy. The framing is on the inside as opposed to the outside. Not very clear plastic at all. It's very cloudy, very thick. Here's the windscreen, same thing. And here's the rear portion. Same type of thing. A lot of flash and gunk on them. So that's about it for the kit. So the tie for this Buffalo to Battle of Midway, of course, is uh, the Marine Corps' operation of Buffaloes at Midway is about the only time that the U.S. Uh, used these in action. Uh, the Marines... Uh, on Midway were VMF-221. They had a uh, group of about 20 uh, F-2A3, the late version uh, made for the uh, Marine Corps, basically. Uh, it was uh, it got armor, got some self-sealing tanks, uh, which uh, weighed down the aircraft uh, with no increase in horsepower. So what, what took a mediocre aircraft and turned it into a dog. Um, VMF-221... Uh, originally was being sent to uh, uh, Wake Island as part of a relief force on the USS Saratoga in December uh, 41, but uh, uh, Wake Island fell before they were able to get there. So Saratoga ended up offloading the squadron onto Midway. And uh, while they were there, uh, they did have one success on uh, March 10th and 42, uh, they got vectored out uh, to uh, intercept a, a snooper, which turned out to be a Kawanishi H8K Amelie, and uh, actually shot it down. A, a guy by the name of Captain uh, James Nephis uh, was the uh, pilot of that uh, victory. So on uh, January f or June 4th of 42, with the first uh, assault by the Japanese to uh, take Wake or Midway Island, uh, uh, the uh, leader, Major Floyd Parks, uh, sometimes called Red, uh, is his nickname, uh, took off with a, with a group of a mixed group from uh, VMF uh, 221 of, of uh, buffaloes and wildcats. And uh, they made a pretty good initial first pass. They came across approximately 30 to 40 valves. They were escorted by 36 zeros. So they made one good pass on them and actually downed a number of vowels, but quickly the zeros got onto them. Uh, ultimately, they lost uh, 13 of the 20 buffaloes and uh, five of the seven 
um, F4Fs that were with them. So the uh, the ones that did survive uh, were able to, to do so mainly by diving away. Uh, if they tried to dogfight with the Zeros, they you know, got uh, got slaughtered. But if uh, the, the pilot had the sense enough to try to get out of the situation and dive away, the, the Buffalo actually had a tremendous dive speed, and the Zero just could not keep up with it. So the uh, most of the survivors, that's, you know, they did this uh, split S dive to, to get away from them. Uh, it was reported that uh, the Japanese did machine gun a number of the uh, Buffalo and uh, other VMF-221 pilots in their parachutes, and also in the ocean. Um, they strafed them as well, so a little bit of a dark part of that battle. Uh, there was also one other squadron that uh, uh, kind of was in the action area. Uh, VMF-211, which uh, was the original squadron that was on Wake Island, that uh, ceased to exist after the Japanese took Wake Island. That was reformed in February of uh, 42. They were given buffaloes and they were uh, shipped down to uh, uh, Palmyra, I Palmyra Atoll to be the defense down there in case the Japanese got, got that far south. And uh, they were uh, basically frontline service until July uh, when they got swapped out for uh, wildcats. So that's a little bit more of the history of... Uh, of the Buffalo and its ties to the Battle of Midway. And uh, as far as the kit goes, uh, you had uh, uh, the original issue from Aoshima in 1964. There was also a Rico uh, issue in 64 as well. I think there that's a, just another name for Aoshima. Aoshima did have two or three more additional releases in the 60s and early 70s. Uh, it was uh, reboxed in the 60s by UPC, which was uh, another one of those companies that was importing a lot of foreign kits, uh, mainly Japanese kits, reboxing them for, for U.S. sales. Uh, Entex, uh, similar again, uh, did did one of these in 1973. And then uh, there's another another reissue of this uh, by Aoshima in 1994, surprisingly. So uh, I, I would imagine that somebody would be a little bit surprised getting this kind of a quality kit in uh, 1994 if there wasn't anything on the box to really kind of give you an idea of what you were getting into. But that's about it. Uh, again, if you've got uh, you know any ties to this kit, built one, um, you know, let us know about it in the comments, you know, your experience with it. If you got any photographs, uh, you know, send it in of your built kits. That'd be greatly appreciated. And so that's about it. Thanks for watching and have yourself a great rest of your day.